thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Let me just make sure I have everything working here. Okay. Yeah, so as Robert said, my background is not the sort of conventional one. I've had a joy talking with everyone at the breaks and the reception last night, and realizing this is a very diverse audience and people coming from different areas. So here's the story of where I'm coming from. I started out as an astrophysicist. My, I'm an amateur astronomer, still am. Here I am at the Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia and my background's in star formation and planet research. So that's where I started. And then things started to change at the end of my undergraduate career when for my senior thesis, I had to visualize data. I was given a massive pile of 3D data over time with all the statistics, and it was a challenge. And I loved it. I couldn't get enough of the challenge of having to visualize this data. So I went ahead and became a research assistant for a couple years, and then moved on and said, you know what? I'm not sure I want to be a professional astronomer. I like this visualization thing. Let me keep pursuing that. I went to graduate school and studied applied physics technically, and, but went ahead and ended up publishing in computer science journals and medical imaging journals and working with astronomers and doctors and physicists and uh, different historians now and saying, I'm gonna help visualize all this data with the skill set I have. And went on to sort of do the typical academic path and went on for a postdoc and faculty. Our story today, however, starts right here where the red arrow is. And that's where we're gonna start today. What happened at this point right near the end of graduate school? I had trouble sleeping. <laughs> I started having insomnia, and it wasn't just, oh my goodness, I have to finish my PhD. But I had an unanswered question. I, couldn't, I could not stop thinking about the following, which is, how, what makes a visualization effective? There are many different definitions for how we'd say what's effective, but at this point in my career, I had been working with all these professionals in trying to help them design effective and high impact visualizations. And I was in my coursework, you know, working and seeing all these amazing visualizations and seeing historic examples of high impact, really powerful visualizations. And I wanted to start getting to the bottom of this. Why, what were some of the pieces that made them so effective? And you know, I, this is still, I don't know how many people, raise your hand if this is your favorite visualization of all time. Yeah, it still is for me. All these years later, this still is. And there are many elements to why this and other visualizations are effective and high impact and memorable. But I decide what, how low can we go? Like what's the bottom of this understanding for a visualization? So I'm gonna build up and start from the ground up. So we'll start with perception. And tons and tons of work has been done in the psychology community as well as the human computer interaction community and the data visualization community to you know, understand how we see things. We see color, we see things that are differences in brightness better, black and white better than color. Things like different types of plots, the Cleveland and McGill studies, the one cited, but there are many, to say we are good at position and doing length judgments versus angle. So there's all this sort of very, very low level understanding of how we perceive visualizations. Now, let's move up the ladder. Sort of one rung up from that sort of pre-attentive perception is memorability. It's one of the key cognitive concepts. And there's a lot of work that's been done, again, in the visualization and HCI communities to understand what makes a visualization memorable, mostly focusing on different types of visualizations or different types of annotations to understand the memorability. Uh, one step up the pyramid from there, one could argue would come something like aesthetics. And there's been a number of studies. And yes, more visualizations that are more beautiful are gonna be easier to understand, they're gonna be more memorable, they're gonna be more enjoyable. That's not a surprise to everyone sitting here. But you can keep stepping up this pyramid and there are all these other concepts that sit higher, engagement, comprehension, impact, and obviously I can't answer the what makes a visualization effective for every step of this pyramid in one itty bitty sort of bite-sized step forward. 
So we're gonna start with this. As a step towards understanding what makes it effective, I decided at the end of my grad school career to ask how do we recognize and recall a visualization? How we remember a visualization, and by maybe answering this type of question, might give us a little hint into how to design effective visualizations, for, especially for communication. Okay, so how I go about and answer a question like this. First, step one was build an interdisciplinary collaboration, because I am not an expert in psychology and cognition. I have a long list of classes I wish I had taken as an undergraduate, and psychology is probably at the top of those, that list now, and statistics. I've had to learn it on the fly, so I need to find experts to help me. Uh, the second was build a database for understanding, because to understand effective design and memorability, we can't just do it with a couple. If we want to go really ground up, we need a lot of visualizations and there was no database out there. Step number three was experiments and sort of designing some experiments to get this question and understand how we recognize a visualization. And finally, synthesizing everything together, get some statistically significant results, fingers crossed. Okay, so let's start the interdisciplinary collaboration piece. So here I am, this was my I can't sleep, I have a question, who do I have around me that can help me work on this. So, first person was my PhD advisor, Hans Peter Pfister, and we were coming from the visualization world. And I remember back at Viz a number of years ago, I was in Seattle sitting in the back row with him, and we were talking about this exact, I was like, oh, you know, memorability, how we do this. So, he was my first sort of Lincoln. He has a friend at MIT, Dr. Aud Oliva. And she has a fascinating background where it's the intersection of computer science with computer vision and psychology. And she you know, is a leader in computational perception and cognition is the formal definition of her field. And she has a wonderful graduate student, Zoya Belinsky. So now we have a couple experts on the cognition and perception side. Turns out human-computer interaction is a key piece of the puzzle too, especially for designing the experiments. So Nam Kim joined uh, Hans Peter's group and joined this escapade along with Professor Shishtof Gaios at Harvard and a whole bunch of other students and professors at the different universities. So step one is now complete. We have this nice interdisciplinary group of experts to work on this together. Step two, the database. So how did we assemble a collection this large? So here we go. We have our database of 5,814 visualizations, and these were scraped from the internet using custom written Python code. And we, gather, we decided to sort of say, like, let's take a real world sample of visualizations. Where are some of the categories where we're gonna see visualizations used commonly? So we have in the database government reports and mostly things like World Health Organization, uh, Treasury, there's some NGOs in there, and we scraped a bunch of websites and gathered a few years worth of visualizations from reports. We went ahead and looked at the Visually blog as a great reference point for getting more infographic and design-based visualizations coming at it from that angle. We then scraped through a bunch of uh, news media websites and it was places like Economist and Wall Street Journal, a little bit of New York Times, and went through all these different news websites and scraped a whole bunch of their visualizations. And finally, we wanted to get sort of academic journals and specifically scientific to take that angle and worked primarily with uh, Nature and scraped through a whole bunch of scientific journal articles from a few years and pulled out all the graphs and plots. So these were the sources that went into our giant database. That's a lot of visualizations, like where you start with that. So we crowdsourced this and had folks on Amazon's Mechanical Turk help sort it through the, these. We pulled out single visualizations. Single means it's a single plot. A lot of these were what we call multi-panel, and they were, a lot of them probably storytelling, you know, multiple panels, multiple step one, step two, step three, different visualizations. Decided that was too complicated to work with to start with, so we went just with single, pain visualizations. We then put together a taxonomy to categorize, and we, for all 2,068 images, sort them, are they a bar chart, a line plot, 
a scatter plot, a network diagram. What type of visual encoding is it? Next, we pulled out a subset of these. It was about 393 visualizations. And for these, we wanted to give a ton of extra information layered on top of them so that when we do some experiments, as you will see in a minute, we would have more detailed information. So for these target visualizations, we went through labor of love manually and noted were they black and white visualizations, how many colors roughly were in the visualization, you know, holistically, you know, was it a good medium or bad data ink ratio, using Tufti's definition for data ink ratio, how visually dense was the image, and did it contain human recognizable objects? So the human recognizable objects would be cartoons like these, it could be photographs or anything else that someone's gonna recognize from the natural real world. So with those targets, we also did the following annotations. We labeled them by hands, a team of us, again, labor of love, and marked exactly where on the visualization was the graph, where were, where was the title, the axis labels, annotations, arrows, every piece was labeled. And I won't get into it today, but there's a whole interesting analysis of understanding screen real estate for different parts of your visualization, but we labeled all of this manually. And then we also transcribed the titles. <laughs> of all these visualizations, the fonts were different, and they were different places, so all the sort of OCR and standard techniques failed, so we manually went through and typed in every single title for these visualizations. We also coded for message and data redundancy in the visualization. So what I mean by this. So up here in our original visualization is a graph, and you know, this one's gender equality and labor force participation. That's fine, it's a graph. Data redundancy we define as a duplicate encoding of the data. So in this case, having labels at the top of 82% for China is duplicate encoding to the length of the bar. This could be cut, you can imagine doing this with color, or scaling size, but having the data represented more than once was what we defined as data redundancy. Next, we had message redundancy. This is sort of encoding your message. What is the main point of the visualization or where are some pieces and you're gonna encode it differently. Here, there, you'll see there's a caption now that explains that China leads in female labor force participation. And we also have flags in here, so you have a visual marker to help you know, duplicate and code what's in the text. Finally, you can put this all together. They're not mutually exclusive and we see this all the time. But this was our attempt to really be specific and granular, understanding some of the design concepts within the visualizations. Okay, so for these 393 targets, we had data and message redundancy. And we launched a series of experiments. We focused on this piece, the single visualizations with these highly annotated target visualizations. Okay, so that's our database. Now let's move on to the experiments. And in this case, we, what were we measuring? So this is your mini cognitive psychology lecture for the day. You're gonna learn three terms that I'll be using for the rest of the talk. The first is encoding. So this is a sort of all in the field of understanding memory. So encoding is this. You have a person, they see an apple, it goes to memory. They encode, this is an apple. So it's basically just writing to memory what you see or what you read. This is what encoding is. Second concept is recognition. And in this case, you've seen the apple before, so you see it and you get an aha moment. And it's that aha moment of, oh right, I've seen this before. That's what we call recognition. And that's sometimes interchangeably used with the term memory or memorability, but I've gotten in all sorts of trouble with my cognitive psychology collaborators to be very careful how I phrase this. So encoding, recognition is the particular stage in memory here. Last concept is recall. And what recall is, is you don't see the original apple. You see something like it. 
you're, it's hinted. It's like taboo or catchphrase. You're sort of beating around the bush or you see something that reminds you. And the point of recall is something would be triggering and you're like, oh yes, I know that. And you can say in this case, it's an apple. It's a red piece of fruit that somehow you're recalling, you're pulling it out of your memory. And that's what recall is. And this is exactly what we decide to measure with a series of experiments, is to do this but for visualizations. How people encode visualizations, how are they gonna recognize them, and what information can they recall about visualization where they don't actually see it? We want to sort of entice and pull out of them. And in this way, we might gain some insight into what visual features in a graph might you know, inspire recognition and recall and maybe even understanding. Okay, so let's go a little deeper now into the experimental design. So the primary experiment we ran was with our 393 highly labeled super annotated target visualizations. Step one was to do the encoding. And for this, people were sitting in our lab and they saw a series of visualizations, they actually saw a few hundred, each for 10 seconds. So they basically were staring at the visualization, got 10 seconds to just look at it, they had no instruction. This was the encoding, this is writing it to memory. Uh, assuming folks in this room are not familiar with eye tracking, this is what an eye tracking setup looks like. Here I am testing out the experiment. And you'll notice it's like going to the eye doctor and you have to sit and put your head in that brace, it's just like that. And you can't let the you know, participant's head move. And in this case, I'm staring at a test image on the screen. And in front of the screen is an infrared camera. And that infrared camera is looking at my eye, it's focused on my eyes, and it's tracking my pupils. So the infrared camera is tracking where my pupils are, and that's calibrated with the visualization display. And then on the eye tracking control computer, it's hard to see, but there's a little white dot here. And that's uh, tracking where my pupil is in reference to where it is on the monitor. So now what we're able to do is have a, someone sit there, look at visualizations, and we can see exactly where they're looking at on the image. And then we have an experimental control computer. So this is a very typical eye tracking lab setup. And then in the visualization here I was showing you, there's a heat map. And the orange and red colors are denoting for everyone in our experiment, if we average all of them together, where are people typically looking on that graph? And so you'll see a lot of these heat map visualizations. Okay, so encoding, you sit there in this eye tracking thing for 10 seconds for a few hundred visualizations. Step two in the experiment was recognition. We want to measure recognition. And the way we did this was by showing people the same visualizations again, but mixed in with a few hundred visualizations they've never seen before. And then what they have to do is I, you know, click a mouse uh, key on their keyboard to say, aha, it's the light bulb moment. Yes, I've seen that before. And that's how we're gonna measure, you know, a very coarse low level. Do they recognize having seen the visualization before or not? And then the last stage is recall. This is the, we show them something like an apple, we want them to say apple. And here we gave them 20 minutes with a bunch of, with all the visualizations, they correctly identified in the recognition phase and in 20 minutes, filling out these little text boxes. And the prompt was describe this visualization in as much detail as possible, describe the visualization. We weren't saying what's the main point, what is this about, it was nothing about the content. It was just describe it, we wanna see what they can recall about the visualization. We had 33 lab participants and the whole thing took about an hour. And the first two parts, they were in the eye tracking get up with breaks in between, and then they could sit separately for the recall. I should note, for the recognition, the encoding and recognition portion of the experiment, we also launched stuff on Mechanical Turk. And that way we could have a much larger sample, but without the eye tracking. And we also, very specifically, we had data for someone looking at the encoding stage for a second. So this is like you're flipping through a magazine or you're scrolling on a web page and you're only glancing at the visualization for a brief amount of time. Like literally in a second, how much information could, you know, is gonna be there and there's huh, quite a lot and help with memory. And we're able to compare these. So let's dive into this experiment. So you can see from the computer's perspective what's going on with the eye tracking. 
So step one is encoding. What you're gonna see here is one of the visualizations, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like from one of our participants' perspective of reading this visualization. And this one came from visually. And then the eye fixation is gonna be a blue dot. So I'm gonna hit play in a second, and you're gonna watch this part, study participant and where they're looking on the graph. So here we go. So now that you know what to expect and what you're looking at, I'm gonna play this again for you. So here's the same visualization, and now here's the person looking with the blue eye dot. Okay. So you might have noticed a few patterns. First, that they start in the center. This is a known phenomena called center bias, and I learned this doing the eye tracking, that this is a known thing for eye tracking studies. If something pops up on the screen, by default, you're looking at the middle of your monitor. You're just staring at the center. So essentially, every visualization, has, they, you know, people start looking in the middle. Second, this particular participant read the title. So they went up, you can see a bunch of the little dots where they're reading third sort of phase in their trajectory is they read across the x-axis to sort of look at the titles of these books and read the labels and look at things. And then at the end, right when they, you know, we had the 10 second time cut off, they were trying to read the axis label. This strategy was pretty much the standard way for everyone in our site. Now, some visualizations are designed very differently, but for sort of the canonical standard visualization, this is how people were reading it. And they start in the middle, found the title, which isn't always in the same place, usually top left or right, sometimes on the bottom, and read captions, then they'd read the data, and then they'd sort of go back and start visually exploring more. So this is a very typical encoding. Oh, thank you for reminding me, I forgot to say that. So we had the 33, uh, it was basically Boston area people. We started piloted with a couple of MIT students, but then open up to so the age range was some, it was broad, it was like 18 to 50, and it was about 50 50 men and women. Yeah. Okay, so step two hundreds of visualizations later, they sat there doing this for hundreds, was the recognition stage. And for the recognition, you know, they'd see, as you will see in a second, a series of visualizations. They have to click a key every time you know, something repeat. We're gonna do this uh, right now, so you get a sense of what this is like for the recognition phase. This is a screen grab of doing it on our Mechanical Turk setup, so the way this worked was fractionally different, but essentially the same. You're gonna see a bunch of visualizations, and about after five seconds, they're going to start repeating. And so if you're doing this at a computer, you would hit your space bar every time you see a visualization a second time and get that light bulb aha moment. In this room, we're gonna clap. So your task is for 30 seconds to put the phone and the laptop down and you're gonna watch these visualizations and it's gonna go visualization and then a black dot and it's gonna clear your field of view. It's like the little sorbetto at a fine dinner. Cleared your field of view, get another image, a dot, another image, and that's gonna go on about five seconds into it. You are gonna notice that they're gonna start repeating. Clap every time you see a visualization that you've seen before. Ready? Go. Very good. <laughs> it takes a lot of cognitive effort. You sit and do this. I've done a bunch of these tests, and you get like so engrossed. You're like, ready, ready, ready. And but this is what people did, and it's amazing for like 20 minutes of going through and measuring and clicking. And uh, as you saw, a lot of you clapped when you had not seen the visualization before. And those are false positives, and we recorded that in our study, and it was really interesting to see what visualizations, you know, what types of visualizations elicited that 
false clapping. And we recorded that and looked at that. Um, and yes, the green plus for every time you correctly did that. So that's what the recognition phase of the experiment was. And now what does it look like in the eye tracking setup? So here's our same participant. That's it. So they saw it, and this was slightly slowed down so you can see it. They look, I'll play it again. So you have in this case center bias, and then they read the title, and that was the end of it. So much shorter bit of time. Last step was recall, and this was conducted hundreds of visualizations later. So in many ways, it was about 40 minutes or longer after seeing it for the first time. And then the question was to say, describe the visualization in as much detail as possible. And they would see a blurred version of the visualization, and that was to try and get that, oh, you've seen it before, reaction. And they type, so what did this user type? The most read books in the world, the order was like one holy Bible, two some Chinese guys, quote, and three Harry Potter. <laughs> this is real, this was what they typed. But, you know, despite their choice of language, yeah, that's not too bad. They remembered what the visualization was, and I, as you will see later, I was shocked at what people can remember about these visualizations, and especially such a long time later. Okay, so last piece here. What were the results? What did we find out from this experiment? So I'm gonna build a table here, and put, first show you from the encoding phase, you know, what the heat maps of the eye tracking look like, but I'm grouping them by most and least memorable. And the memorable rating, I won't go into the details, was in the recognition stage of the experiment. So when you do the clapping, which one's got the most consistent correct clapping? So what does it look like for encoding? These were some of our most memorable visualizations from the experiment. And again, the yellow-red heat map denotes where people are looking, and these were the least memorable. Take a moment, take a look. It's really interesting. Remember from our eye tracking, there's a center bias, so people tend to look in the middle. And then people tend to read the title and the captions, and then they tend to look at the data, and you can pretty much see that here. So this is 10 seconds of encoding. In the second phase of the experiment, this was the recognition where you only see it for a second. This is what the eye tracking heat maps look like for the most memorable and for the least. And now there's a visible difference. Note that the most memorable ones have just this big blob in the center versus the least memorable. The patterns look near, very, very similar, nearly identical to the first time they saw it. What's going on? In this case, all the person had to do was stare at the middle and that, and remember we have peripheral vision here too, they see it in, in a snap, in a glance. They know they've seen it before. They don't have to look around in the visualization. They know it's the correct, you know, oh yes, I've seen this. With the least memorable visualizations, they don't remember it. They have to basically start re-exploring, re-reading the title, keep re-reading the caption, re-reading the annotations, trying to remember it. They're trying to elicit that uh, light bulb moment. What's happening here is the most memorable ones had very, very strong visual associations in them, visual hooks into memory, and the least memorable had semantic, you know, the, one, the people were looking for semantic associations. They were looking for a word. They couldn't recognize it visually, so they were looking for a keyword or a phrase to trigger their memory. So the visual associations were things like uh, human recognizable objects, so photos, cartoons, anything from the real world. Uh, visual annotations, um, like arrows and lines or trend lines or different pieces on the graph. There was also the type of visualization. So particular visualization types like network diagrams or things that were unusual or scatterplots. There were subtleties and those became visual associations. They're visually unique. Semantic associations are things like titles and captions anything that's sort of textual descriptions, labels, axis labels, and these are all the sort of semantic hooks into memory. 
These are two categories, and our brain, from a low-level processing point of view, it's a you know, dual encoding theory. You sort of have one channel that's doing all the visual stuff, and you have a different channel that takes in all the verbal textual things. So this is really hooking into those two. In the visual, 50% of our brain's processing you know, uh, is going towards, at that pre-attentive level, it's all about the visual. So not surprising that these visual associations can hook you into memory. Recognition. So I'm gonna plot here from, this is what I call at-a-glance encoding. This was like you guys did just the short one second, you know, flipping through a magazine style. And we have all the visualizations here represented by little boxes ranked according to memorability. So from least to most memorable when you only have a second or two to glance at them. Well, what happens for the, in our experiment when you have 10 seconds? Now you have time to read the text and look at the visualization longer. It turns out the ordering is nearly identical. So the ordering from most to least memorable stayed the same. But the distribution got shifted up to the top. And what's happening here is that the most memorable stayed the most memorable because they had such strong visual associations embedded in the plots. They were so visually distinct, it just overwhelmed everything and it stayed the same. The whole bulk shifted up in distribution and that's because of the semantic associations. When people have time to read, then they're getting all these other hooks into memory. And so that's the semantic association and then it kind of surprised me. The least memorable visualizations stayed the least memorable and did not bump up in distribution. Like they stayed at the bottom because there were no distinct visual or semantic associations with them. So if it was not memorable at one second, there's no way, you know, more time, it's not going to make a difference. It's still not going to stick in memory. Okay, recall. So describe the visualization in as much detail as possible. So we gathered 2,773 text descriptions that people typed in at the end. And for all of these descriptions, we went through and we manually denoted what labels were mentioned. And the labels were things like, did they talk about the chart? Did they talk about the title? Did they talk about an annotation in the graph? Did they mention an access label? So we wanted to know what pieces they, of the visualization they were sort of voluntarily re able to recall. And we also went through and manually gave a, you know, a ballpark description quality metric. So from one to three. Uh, so in this little uh, plot here, a good description would be something to the effect of a map of the UK talking about renewable energy and bioenergy was the, you know, top one. That's a three. A one would be, you know, renewable energy or energy and wind power, something very vague. Still on topic, but not very detailed. So we rated these from one to three. So here is our bar chart showing the total number, number of mentions of each of these elements, and you will quickly notice that title by far was the most mentioned thing in the text recall, as well as label and paragraph. The textual things, those jumped to the top. And then, you know, the other visual things were much further, but the sort of takeaway from this is good titles help with recall. If you put a clear, well-communicated title on your plot, not only is someone gonna actually understand, hopefully, what you're trying to communicate, but it hooks into memory stronger than any of these other semantics and many, any of these other labels for recall. Here's an example from our database, election debate, that visualization, eh, not, not so much, but a number three quality rating of 66% of Americans feel Romney prefer, performed better than Obama in the debates fared incredibly well and people, and when I say title here for this 1,252 count, it was essentially verbatim repeating the title with minimal you know, changes in the pronouns. I, I could not believe it, but <coughs> title really did this. So now we're gonna make a plot. And the plot here is going to have memorability on the y-axis, so most to least memorable. 
And then the x-axis is the description quality, sort of looking at what visualizations had like a one or even a zero versus a three. So these were the most memorable visualizations uh, in the study, but now split apart by the quality of the description. And here were the least memorable. You will notice that the top half of this graph, the more memorable, have human recognizable objects. They have pictograms. They have a lot of text. They have titles. They have annotation. They have uh, a lot of colors. They're very colorful. And then the bottom, literally just visually, you can see it's all the way from the back of the room, are a little blander, a little simpler. That's OK. Um, there's some visual uh, elements in there. But what I care about is the top right quadrant. What's the sweet spot of visualizations that were memorable, but also produce these high quality descriptions during the recall? It, the thing they had in common was that they all had visual associations in them. They all had semantic associations. They all had message redundancy, like I described earlier in the description. They all had data redundancy, so it wasn't just the plot, but they somehow did duplicate encoding or annotation. And they all had really good titles and annotations. And this became the sort of magic recipe for a visualization to make it into that top right quadrant. A quick side note about the human recognizable objects, because I always get asked about this in the Q&A at the end, so here we go. So a few more notes about the use of pictograms in the visualizations in our study. First that the human recognizable objects did not hinder visualization recall. So one hypothesis I had going in was, oh, people are gonna get distracted by all the pictures, and it's not gonna, well, actually, you know, it did not hinder the recall. They actually were able to recall these visualizations and write good stuff about them, good quality. The fixation time was the least of all the visual elements. And I had to talk to a few psychologists to sort of tear this one apart, but the theory is, we are trained to recognize objects from the natural world. So you see a photo of something, it kind of just like is snap, it's perfect. Visualizations are abstract. It's a visual literacy. You have to learn how to read a graph. Reading is cognitively very intensive. It takes a long time to read through text. And so those things actually require most of a viewer's attention when going through a visualization. The other visual elements and visual associations, not as much. The recall description was higher, as I mentioned, for the visualizations that had these human recognizable objects. And these human recognizable objects were a lot of them very, you know, appropriately designed to help with message redundancy. That in many cases, the pictograms were part of the data itself, or they were trying to enforce the message of what the graph was trying to provide. So here's an example. This is one of our most memorable visualizations in the experiment. And this was from a Nature Journal article about the evolution of the Tyrannosaurus rex, in case you were curious. Here are some of the descriptions people wrote during that recall stage, 40 minutes after they originally saw it, and they saw a blurry version. This is the kind of stuff they were writing, at the evolution from Jurassic period to Cretaceous T. rex is towards the top. I could not. And this one doesn't even have a title. There's no title in this one. And people were coming up with these things. And it wasn't until I read the description talking about the feather bird-like thing that I went back to the original paper. And that was part, like what the graph was trying to show. And that some of these dinosaurs you know, were theorized to have feathers. Simply. So anyways, this is a nice example of pictograms being used as part of the data representation. And it truly helped with the recall. But this is definitely not always true. There are plenty of times like this one where pictograms can definitely hurt your visualization to understand. They can hurt recall. Or in this case, people could recognize it. It was memorable. But the text descriptions were things like this. It had a dinosaur on the top, Starbucks. And I would argue that in this case, the title, the annotations, the pictures, 
for not helping with the message redundancy. They were not helping with data redundancy. Um, so there's certainly something to be said about design and there's all sorts of issues here, but these were the types of descriptions. And we saw a lot of examples like this, where the pictograms were chosen by the designer a particular way. To, they were maybe engaging and memorable, but certainly not helping get the message across to the viewer. So what were su the summary of the key findings from this work? There are many, many findings, but for think about storytelling and communication, here's the summary. Visualizations that are memorable at a glance have memorable content. So just bear in mind that if you're flipping through the newspaper and something is memorable, it's gonna be memorable even with longer exposure, is what we found. Titles and text are key elements in a visualization, and they can help recall the message if the visualization's designed that way, that titles and text are really, really important. Human recognizable objects, such as pictograms, can help with the recognition and recall of a visualization. They tap into that visual association bin of annotations in a visualization. They can really help uh, grab your memory. And redundancy helps with visualization recall and understanding. That having that data redundancy as well as message redundancy is going to help pull that visualization from memory and you know, help ensure that someone's walking away and has you know, understood it. A footnote here, and I'll read it for all of you in the back, that empirical evidence in support, this is all empirical evidence in support of many conventional qualitative effective visualization design guidelines. I was taking notes in the background, I was so excited. So many of you were giving these fantastic presentations earlier. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that, 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 that. And thinking about story arcs and thinking about pictorial elements and message redundancy in your communication. Um, so a lot of what this is, is really the empirical evidence in support of things that we, we kind of knew worked just through experiment. But now in this case, these findings are supporting empirically Yes, that's true, but also why? Why, from a cognitive psychology point of view, does it work so well? So coming back to our pyramid, so the key findings pile into our step on memory. And hopefully, I mean, it's just one little brick in this pyramid. There's a lot of work to be done, but it's there, and we have a little understanding and a lot of work to still do. And because I know someone's gonna be out there thinking it, because I thought about it too, Here's my favorite visualization, Charles Menard's Napoleon's March. And I will just dutifully note, it has a very nice descriptive title. It has a beautifully written caption uh, with some nice message redundancy. It's a map, it's a sort of you know, visual, it's not necessarily human recognizable object, but we all are familiar with maps and spatial. It has data redundancy. It, he labels not just the width of the line here, but gives a number, and there's a lot of examples here of data redundancy. And we also have tons of annotations, especially trying to connect uh, the map, which is a little easier to understand, to this line graph at the bottom showing temperature and sort of giving extra annotations to help the reader. There are many reasons this graph works, but I just thought I'd throw that up there so you could see, yes, Menard had an excellent title on his plot. So now speaking of memory, you can all forget this talk. That's okay. That, I, my feelings will not be hurt. And I just hope that you'll remember this, that sort of things like message and data redundancy can help. Descriptive titles are really important in design. Just pause the next time you go make a visualization and think, you know, based on the context and if it's appropriate for the audience and where you're publishing it. Should I do a little more message redundancy? Do I need data redundancy? Do I have a good title on this plot? Did I label my axes? Because realize that every brush stroke and every piece of text on your visualizations has a measurable impact on whether someone's gonna recall and understand it. So with that, I'll say thank you and take a few questions. And one side note before I take questions, everything you saw today, uh, we have, my collaborators and I have put out the mass viz data set and we have released, in the love of e-science, all of our data, all the eye tracking data, all the text annotations, all of our MATLAB code to do this. <laughs> so as the papers, and you know, so feel free, have at it. 
and you can go play with this. And we really are encouraging and hoping that the greater community can keep this work moving forward and look at other aspects that we have in aesthetics, emotion, engagement, or specific topics. So I'll leave that URL up there for you. Thanks. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions, so we'll start here. In your original um, explanation, you talked about pulling the examples from government, infographics, mm -hmm. news media, and scientific. <coughs> Did, do you recall if those, uh, the ones that were the most uh, recalled or remembered or whatever, um, if they fell into one of those four categories? Yes, so the most, I don't have a slide hidden for that. The most memorable category were the visualizations that we scraped from visually. So ones that were coming from the infographic design community, but very close, right behind it, were the visualizations from the scientific journals. From the scientific? Yes, I kid you not, the scientific journals. Okay. That's what, that's, I also hypothesize. I thought news media would be like, whoo, right? But no, and it basically the ordering was, uh, it was infographic, scientific journal, news media, and then government reports at the bottom. And that was true for the lab and for the hundreds of people we got in Turk. It was consistent. And part of that is the scientific journals, it turns out, although I have, trust me, as a scientist, I like, cringe at most of the visualizations in there and there's no narrative and I don't understand what's going on, but they're very visual. They tend to have more than a lot of the other communities label things with pictures and have photographs. They'll have illustrative diagrams to explain what's in the graph. They tend to use a lot of colors and color annotation. They also, you know, tend to, they don't put titles, which drives me nuts and that's partially because of you know, the convention of how you publish in a journal, but they tend to do a decent job of visual associations, so that's what sort of bumps them up in rank. And besides, I think the scientific journal more of a black and white yeah. academic journal, but I, I'm thinking it would be something No, and one thing to note for the journals is we scraped uh, you know, stuff from the last five years, so most of the graphs were color. Historically, because of uh, publication prices and charges, they're all black and white, and it's, it's a different type of data set that we'd be using for that. Um, but that was very surprising in the study. Yeah. Let's see. Over there. Um, so my question is, we've been told, it seems like your research sort of counters a lot of the, the, the best practices, sort of, sort of like show, don't tell, for example, is the one that I hear, we've heard that several times today. Mm -hmm. But your, your examples of message redundancy where for example, you know, the 66% of people, um, yeah. th you're basically telling people. And then the other example about the, which countries, that they had, you had one where the China was the first, mm -hmm. essentially that's tell and show. Mm -hmm. So is that the better guideline, for example, versus show, don't tell? It's gonna depend on your audience. And it's so first off, it does depend on where you're publishing the graph and what the context is. Because there are many cases I could imagine where you want show, don't tell, and tell, don't show, show but, in this case, it's trying to say that the more you show and tell, the more, you know, the more easily someone will remember it and understand what's going on based on this. But it really is the caveat is, it depends on what you're trying to do. A uh, question over here on, oh, I'm sorry, was there follow-ups? Okay, over here. Uh, when you took a deeper dive into your human recognizable objects findings, yes. um, I noticed the one that stood out to me the most was the dinosaur. <laughs> so I have an animal question. Yes. So did you find anything that we recognize and recall or um, remember those more? Because I'm thinking yeah. of advertisers, you know, and they'll just, you know, we'll throw a dog or a cat or a gecko on there and we'll be good. <laughs> Just for the record, please do not walk away from my talk and put rainbows and kitty cats all over your graphs. That's <laughs> not the point of this, because that will be highly memorable, but not effective for other measures. The answer is human faces, more than any other human recognizable object. And we saw that, and there are a lot of other studies that came out around the same time from the same cognitive <coughs> psychology lab over at MIT. Human faces tap into our brains 
because of evolution like nothing else. You're trained to recognize other people. And if you see a human, that light bulb's gonna go off, but like brighter and bigger than some of the other human recognizable objects. And it's an evolution thing. Um, so human faces were sort of top, but very close behind were just sort of other things, other photo things that were photographs, natural world would sort of come next. And then below that is you know things like logos or other cartoon illustrations of people and things. Uh, so they're very close. If you look at the error bars on the plot, they're going to be very, very, very close. But human faces and photo, you know human photographs, those ticked higher than everything else. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This is just a phenomenal talk, and it's like so packed with useful information. Um, I have a question about um, cross-cultural comparison. And so, mm -hmm. so one of the things I'm wondering, it sounds like most of the people who were doing this were US-based, is that yes. correct? So one of the things I'm wondering is, is there research on how people in different cultural contexts perceive data or how they might process data? And like, do you think these findings would be transferable across different cultural contexts and also different literacy levels? Because as you're acknowledging, obviously like there's a lot mm -hmm. of visual literacy, like you kind of need to know that these squares on a bar chart mean something. Like there's like, and even just reading maps and things like that, there's like a kind of leap. We're not born reading maps, right? Um, and so I just wonder, what do, you, what do you think about that question? Is there literature in these different domains that you have gone in that examines these questions and what might we? There's not about? nearly enough literature and research on that. And there's a footnote, you know, in the paper when I wrote this, and it's that this is done with, you know, the Amazon study, you know, the online in-person people in the U.S., you know, who are 18, and it wasn't a requirement, but everyone here was at least enrolled as an undergraduate, you know, sort of having that sort of college level in the higher degree. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. Cross-cultural, we really do need more research on that. Because this is biased by the fact that we're reading left to right you know, and having a certain set of our language skills. And visualizations are definitely designed in different manners in different parts of the world, in different cultures. There's different conventions, different layout conventions. So uh, the research has not been done, and it, it really should be. And there, I know a few citations out there for looking at the differences between how you visualize data in different parts of the world, but there isn't enough research in that area yet. So please, somebody out there, work on that. <laughs> Hi, Michelle, thank you for the presentation. I'm, I'm wondering if there's something uh, simple going on with the title, just in terms of the font size, and if that makes a difference. Ooh, me, um, yeah. And then second question is, um, could you say a little bit more about color choice? Sure, so the font size, we looked at not explicitly says, but we looked at how big the label was where we drew the rectangle around where the title was, and we also looked at position. And I, we were thinking there'd be a difference between whether you have a title like top left, top right, is it in the middle, and we had things all over. And with our data set, statistically significantly, there was no difference between title size and location. It might take someone a fraction of a second longer to scan your visualization to find the title, but once they found the title, they still read it. You know, my own personal opinion, there's no data to back this up is, yeah, sure, make the title readable, top half, you know, nice font, but no, there was no actual data to back any of that up. Um, the color, what we found is that more color meant it was more memorable, more recognizable. And that's, but it's interesting, you don't actually remember color. What happens is color serves to segment an image. So I'm gonna see someone you know, in the front row with a purple shirt and brown pants, and my brain is interpreting the color to help segment into pieces. You're gonna segment a bar graph. If things are colored, like you know, bar A is gonna be red and green and blue, you're gonna remember, but in your brain, you're act you essentially don't remember the color. You're remembering the segmentation that something was more emphasized than something else, which was really interesting. So what happens is the more memorable visualizations having more color, it's that there's more segmentation, more pieces, and it's like turning into a pseudo visual association um, from a memory point of view, from a visualization understanding 
point of view, or I should say specifically recall, like the text recalls, there was no statistically significant difference between black and white or colored or how many colors. We were looking for that, and we actually didn't see it in our experiments um, for an effect of color on recall. It was just at that low level. But again, more work needs to be done there. <laughs> One of your findings was that redundancy helps with recall and memorability. Mm -hmm. I'm curious whether you looked at anything or have a view based on the research of whether there's an ideal amount of redundancy. Because I have to imagine there's a point where more redundancy, redundancy actually slows down processing. So I don't have empirical stuff to back that up. I can say looking at the results from these studies though, what happens is if you have more data and message redundancy, it turns into visual clutter and visual clutter is going to hurt understanding. It might still be sort of visually distinct, but at a certain point, there's gonna be too much of it. And I can show you guys, if anyone wants to catch me during the break, plenty of examples I have. Too much is gonna hurt it. Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah, um, just looking around the room, I know people here have produced a ton of really excellent examples of sequential storytelling things that are in motion, animated mm -hmm. things. Are you aware of any research out there that measures the, the recall of the story arc of things that are more than just static images like you have in this database? The answer is no. And it's a really, really good question. And I've been thinking about the same question all day today sitting in the back of the room. I don't know of anything that looks at story arc or even video animated visualizations. Remember, this is the static. So this isn't taking into account interactive visualizations in the web. It's not a video sort of story. But no, those, to the best of my knowledge, all unanswered questions. But they should be explored. Okay, uh, I was wondering if in your research you've looked at all at the relationship between recall and persuasion or how much you believe the finding of that image? Uh, I was at a conference at MIT on fake news this past weekend, and I think a lot of your work really reminded me of the types of things we discussed, mm -hmm. um, especially if an image is title and caption, and these like very objective factors can make it more memorable, then how does true journalism compete with fake journalism when they can just optimize their work for these factors? Um, and I wonder what your research has to that. So the answer is I haven't done actual research on that. I have been talking with a few of my journalist friends about that specifically, and I can say very just, you know, aside from this project, I'll take a step back. Yeah, you can obviously take advantage of all of these factors. It's the sort of lying with data, lying with visualization thing. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. All those cliches that you wanna be careful how you use this, because of course you could use this stuff for persuasion and to encode the wrong message and make it memorable for the wrong reason. But this hasn't touched exactly on that, but I really hope either I or you know, other people will look into the concept of persuasion and argument and convincing for these visualizations. Okay. Oh, thank you for uh, this study. It's great to see more evidence coming out. <laughs> um, and uh, along the lines of sequential storytelling, I was wondering if you looked at your data set at all to see if the order in which the images appear matters mm -hmm. to recall. Like when we did look at that. Okay. I'd love to hear Yeah, what and the answer is we, there was no difference. So we designed the experiment so that the images were shuffled, so that every person was seeing them in different orders. And we still looked at like images, you know, and everything was d evenly distributed in the study among the different venues and the different types of visualizations. We had this whole algorithm that was spinning them out in this as best we could randomized order, and we saw no effect about the order of visualization or even like literally was the first image from a particular site, there was no effect. But it was just because it's such a big data set, we were able to meet that out. Good question though. Yeah. Last question. Uh, so, um, so you remember I was the person who asked who your subject pool was? Yes. And the reason I did that is because when you put up the book one, mm -hmm. I read it very differently than the eye tracking one because I, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm trained in this field, right? I, I, my, my, I did the center bit, and then I went over to the, the Bible, and then I went up to the top mm -hmm. of it and read the label, and then I went and read the axis, and then I started going right, which is like a very different order than, than what, what you found people, people reading that. And here's my point. Here's the interesting observation. So we've already today seen builds where, you know, 
we're skilled at this, right? So a good build is like put up the axes first because then you can understand, you know, put up the title, then the axes, mm -hmm. and then put up the data because then those marks actually are falling into a semantic context that, that, that actually helps you understand them. Now, I'm trained to do that with my eyeballs, but most, but, but you know, people in Boston aren't. And so that's mm -hmm. one of the things, <laughs> That's, that's one of the things that we, ha we have to overcome, as is what I say. No, and I think it is interesting, the concept of the visual literacy and learning to read images differently, and that is something everyone's gonna be a little different, even in the data set, you know, there were different strategies for the same image, and it wasn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, and it is fascinating what you comment about building something on a graph, and I'd sort of, it, to me it's very different. If I'm giving a presentation, even if I have a really good title, it's gonna depend the context in which I'm presenting it. Do I want the spoiler alert to throw it up there for the whole duration of me building the graph, or am I building up a climax? Am I sort of building up my bar, you know, my chart bar by bar, and then boom, I put the title at the end to sort of drive home what the main point is. So, but that's something that needs more exploration. And I, I should note that I've changed how I do presentations and how I make plots professionally and not based on this, and I am a little more attuned to these factors. And even though I had one unanswered question, you know, starting at the beginning with the red arrow on the timeline, now I have many, many, many more unanswered questions, many of which you guys are touching on. Great, well, thanks. Well, thank you so much. I know there